Good morning, Broncos fans. Thank you for joining. This is going to be a great show today. I was able to spend some time at Broncos practice yesterday, and that was very insightful. So I have quite a bit of information to bring to you today. So this is Legends of Mile High. I'm Thomas Hall, where we take current events and blend it with a historical perspective. As you know, we want to keep the storied history of the franchise alive. So please, please stay tuned till the end because we're going to do the Mile High or the Mile High Legend, which uh, today is an interesting twist uh, about a player who was one of the most dynamic receivers in uh, Broncos history that we know very little about. So stay tuned for that, and also subscribe. Please subscribe to Mile High Huddle YouTube and uh, follow me on Twitter at Thomas Hall NFL. You know all this stuff. Tell your friends, tell your family. But anyway, this is going to be a great show. Uh, some very good tidbits of information coming out from practice yesterday. It was a hot one. I got sunburnt even though I had sunscreen on, but it was well worth it. It was a great time. Put together the uh, the Broncos put together a salute to service thing with the USAA. Uh, incredible uh, time. The it was uh, fun to watch the uh, military folks go through a lot of the uh, courses that they do at the Combine. Uh, it was a fun time, and uh, it was a great program. And I was able to get this cool hat from it. And um, if you didn't know, they're sold out at the uh, um, at the uh, merchandise store there at uh, UC Health Training Center. So I am going to figure out a way to give this hat away to someone uh, from the show or from Twitter. So. Keep, keep in mind that uh, I'm going to figure out something and uh, some lucky person's going to have that hat. So uh, that'll be great. And let's just jump into the chat a little bit. Talk to uh, some of the folks coming in. Diamond Rattler. Boom. Let's ride. That's right. And that's incredible. I mean, I got a story to tell about Russell Wilson. Uh, so ha hang on just a second. Jeremy Sean, thank you for coming in this morning. Good morning, Thomas. Excited. We are getting closer to meaningful football. Absolutely. Uh, we are not far away, and this last preseason game is going to be huge for a few players, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, Albert Knoppers, morning, Thomas and Broncos country. Good morning to you, Albert. Thank you for joining. Uh, again, this is going to be a fun show. So first, I just want to uh, give a uh, thank you to one of the service members that I met. Uh, Teddy, if you're watching the show, you said you might tune in this morning. Just want to say thank you for sitting and chatting with me. It was great, Air Force guy. Uh, I really appreciated the uh, the time that we were able to chat about, uh, about Broncos football. Uh, so thank you very much. So let's just talk about Russell Wilson for just one second. We know that people are telling, saying that he's corny and, and whatnot, but I'm telling you what, they get, they, this is one of the most genuine, nice people. I mean, a superstar quarterback uh, takes the time to to sign autographs for fans, meet fans, but it was, it was an interesting thing. So yesterday, John Elway had his uh, wine cellar there kind of promoting it. And there was a guy doing trivia. So he grabbed um, Russell Wilson and he, uh, he had him answer some trivia questions about the Broncos. It was fun to watch, but he was giving him hundred dollar bills uh, every time he get a, an answer, right? So Russell Wilson at the end of practice, this is all happening in the end of practice, gathered all the uh, military folks together and had them uh, throw the football at the crossbar. And anyone that hit it, he was giving the money up to. Because, I mean, he, he doesn't, he, he's got a huge contract and a bigger one coming, obviously. So it was very fun to watch that. And I don't care how, uh, you know, anybody from Seattle or whoever saying he's corny and whatnot. The guy's nice, generally nice, genuinely nice. It was a great thing for him to do. And uh, it was a lot of fun. He spent at least... 15, 20 minutes after practice with, with these folks. So, uh, man, shout out to Russell Wilson for being, for being a cool person. So, um, Albert, thank you for coming back in. It is a great disrespect towards Broncos that many Broncos legend do not get added to the hall of fame. Uh, yeah. So I have my beef with that. Uh, I've expressed that many times, you know, recently there has been a lot of Broncos that have gotten in. So I can't really complain about the recent, Stuff other than Randy Gratishar not getting in. That was a huge, uh, huge injustice. I wrote about that. I feel like it was a, um, a kind of a, a agenda job by a single voter that got uh, Joe Klecko in over him. But, you know, 
what can we do other than just keep trying to support Randy Gratishar, be respectful. Hopefully he gets in. He deserves it. But my beef really is isn't with the current more current ones. It's the older um, the older Broncos. I mean, it took until 2004 to get the first Bronco in the Hall of Fame. That was John Elway. I mean, he was the first ballot Hall of Famer. Everybody knew he was going in. But for a team that has gone to had gone to four Super Bowls and then finally went, winning two more in the 90s to have only a single person in in 2004, that's I mean, that's kind of ridiculous in my mind. So you've, you've got several players that were deserving to get in and didn't get in and they've just been pushed down. So people like Randy Gratishar, Louis Wright, uh, Carl Mecklenburg, these are people that have been moved to the senior pool now. And we're trying to get, you know, people are trying to get them in when they should have been in already. Then we can argue about some of the merits of the other players who, um, you know, maybe are, I would consider Hall of Famers, but uh, maybe borderline Hall of Famers. So, you know, there's people like Riley Odoms and Tom Jackson that we could be making arguments for. Whether they get it or not, I don't know, but um, that's where we should be at. And that's where a lot of uh, Cowboys fans are, uh, Steelers fans are. They've gotten all those guys in. And now they're arguing about people that are, are borderline. So, yeah, thank you for that comment. Uh, I think I think we'll you know we'll see Randy Gratishar get in in the next uh, year or two with the new new voting um, or the new uh, structure that they've put three seniors in. He he better because it's uh, it's it is an injustice. So so thank you for that. Uh, and Albert Knopper served the U.S. military while I was in the Dutch Army. Well. I'm going to anybody that's coming in from uh, probably coming in from the Facebook uh, stars or uh, definitely doing super chat here on YouTube. Uh, I think that's kind of a way I'm going to figure out, you know, do a drawing and ho hopefully, you know, hopefully Albert, you can, uh, you can win this, this hat. And it, 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 true. I, I talked to the guys at the merchandise store, they're sold out and I, I was lucky enough to grab one. So it was awesome. And I also got to talk to Rod Smith for a while. It, it was incredible. Brilliant. Uh, you know, brilliant insight on, on football and the current team. So that was fun too. I just had a great time. And uh, then I was able to, I mean, I was able to witness practice beforehand, which was incredibly insightful, even though it was just shirts and, and shorts, there wasn't any real physical play going on, but there were some really interesting developments. So I'm going to first talk about wide receivers and tight ends. So there's really not much intrigue left across the roster, but that kind of final wide receiver spot is definitely up in the air um, a little bit. They have given Brad J Brand Johnson every chance to win that role, and he's pretty much grabbed a hold of it. So I mean, he was running with the first team uh, a little bit uh, yesterday from what I saw. And, you know, they're trying to work him into some special teams. Uh, so to give him that opportunity, that's the only thing that has me kind of doubting whether or not he's going to get that role is, is how much he's going to play on special teams. Because that sixth wide receiver and fifth wide receiver, for that matter, has to be uh, impactful on special teams, has to play a lot on special teams, on coverages and returns and stuff like that. And, and Montreal, Washington is the returner without a doubt. So he, John's going to have to figure out a way to win some roles on coverage uh, teams in order to, to land that spot. And I know that they've been talking about Tyree Cle Ty Cleveland. Uh, he's a good special teamer. So it's going to go down to the wire. I think there's maybe three players that have a legitimate shot of that sixth wide receiver. And, and Brandon Johnson is, is one that's got a kind of a stranglehold on that position right now. If they were only talking about wide receiver position, he he definitely has that. But the special teams definitely comes into play. But I think the rest of the that team is solidified. It, it's you know obviously Sutton, Judy, Hamler, and then Montreal Washington. I actually think he's going to be the fourth receiver off of the bench um, in a lot of situations. They were having him run with the first team. Um, he is a dynamic player. Like I've said before, he's going to have some gadget plays where he's kind of getting the ball somehow in space, either from, uh, you know, some running plays or some quick screens. He's going to be a damn player for them. And then I think it's Hinton. Uh, Kendall Hinton has kind of grabbed a hold of that fifth role, and I think he's going to uh, kind of uh, come out on top there. So that's the wide receiver position. And then the tight end position, which is is funny to me because when, when that original depth chart came out, that 
projected depth chart, they had Sobert way down the list. And from what I saw in training camp, and uh, I, I felt that was out of place. So <laughs> what I saw yesterday was Sobert running with the ones, splitting out wide a lot, especially with two tight end sets. They're going to use him as a weapon a lot. And he's going. he's actually really improved this year. Man, he is huge. I don't know if when he walked by me uh, yesterday, I looked up at him and I was, you know, I got to, to talk to uh, a few of the offensive linemen. They're big, but Sobert was shockingly big. I don't even know if his uh, his height and weight is correct on that um, on that roster chart because he looked jacked and tall, big and he was fast. So he's going to be a weapon. So I, I think he's solidified that that tight end room, really. I mean, it's obviously going to be. Um, Alberto and Dulcich and um, probably Tomlinson. And then Sobert's that fourth guy for sure. And I think he's going to actually be coming off the bench early. I mean, I think Alberto's the starter and maybe, and maybe Sobert might just take that role from him. Sunny days. Thank you for coming in. I appreciate that. Uh, thumbs up some uh, orange and blue hearts. We love Broncos country and we love Broncos country here. Thank you for that chat. Uh, EJ, good morning, Thomas and Broncos country. Good morning to you. I'm glad you, I'm glad you're able to join this morning. It's good seeing you again. Uh, so thank you very much. So that tight end room is pretty much set. And I think, uh, the other piece, which we don't uh, quite talk about much is, is Beck, Andrew Beck. He's the only fullback on the roster. They were running, uh, some, uh, two back sets with him as fullback, uh, running into pass patterns. So I think, I actually think he's going to make that team. So you're going to see really five tight ends if you count Saab, uh, if you count uh, Beck, who's kind of a fullback, H-back tight end piece. And I think they're going to be using those uh, tight ends as a wide receiver often as well. So you're going to have a lot of weapons between wide receiver and tight end this year. So uh, keep keep an eye on the preseason. I think I think the preseason game is going to determine – who gets that last wide receiver spot. But I think the rest is pretty much solidified. Albert, I appreciate you coming. Montreal will also get reps next to KJ for speed attacks. Yeah, that's going to be fun to watch if they do put them both on the field at the same time, especially with, you know, with the ability that Russell Wilson has to throw that deep ball. But yeah, he's going to be a dynamic player for them. And, you know, as a rookie, you can't expect a ton, but I think, you will see him play more often than we anticipated. So we can move on now from uh, wide receiver and tight end, and we can start to talk about some of the other positions. So I know there's a few others that may be up in the air. Offensive line, I'll just hit that quickly. We uh, we got to see uh, Billy Turner siding, which is great because um, it means he's coming back into uh, to health getting where it worked back in. I still think Calvin Anderson's the starter, uh, at least to start the season because uh, Billy Turner only took a few reps with the first team. He's still kind of working back into it, but um, he looks to be getting back to health. So that's, that's a great sign. Billy Turner, um, if he can push Calvin Anderson and make him better or you know, take the spot, then the offensive line is really going to start to shape up. So that's, that's incredible. Um Chris H is coming in, sir. Uh, what are your biggest concerns about the team? Uh, well, <laughs> I don't have many concerns about the team. I know that people were upset about the depth from the preseason game, but you have to understand depth isn't going to be like that. The Bron if the Broncos are putting their second and third team out there uh, for the entire game without any starters, then you can definitely be concerned. But I, there's a, a little bit of depth. Uh, areas that kind of concern me. So cornerback is one with Ojemudia going down. He might, um, if they want to get other people on the roster, he might end up going on IR. And that's a, that's an experienced player who may not be around. I mean, he's got a four to six week timetable. Uh, I think they want, if they want to keep a couple of their, uh, a couple of the other players in different position groups, they may put him in, on IR, which would be unfortunate. And that's, th then you've got really rookies possibly in the cornerback spot uh, as depth. You've got Hicks and um, Mathis, or you've got Bless Austin, who is a really good cornerback, uh, but he just can't stay healthy. 
and that's his that's the biggest concern so my my concern really is in in the depth of the cornerback area i know that the de- defensive line got blown off the ball uh in that preseason game but you have to remember their four top four rotation guys really didn't play at at all or just very very little so you're going to see a difference when it's Draymond Jones, DJ Jones, Purcell, and Williams through that rotation. So I'm not overly concerned with that, but cornerback depth is definitely a concern for me. And the other thing that I don't know about, because we haven't seen them in live action really, other than some scrimmages, is how the offensive line, the starters, have gelled and come together and can, can communicate well. Uh, when the when the games really start, they, they have to be – in time you know so especially with that outside zone scheme the communication has to be crisp so we haven't seen that so i mean that's a concern to me but hopefully it you know those concerns will be washed away after the first game so i'm going to just jump into quickly into the defensive lines as i was talking about that i actually from camp thought that that rotation was pretty much set you know before i talked about then their their rookie that they drafted Uzer um, you know they're not going to let him go. He, he actually is a very big, uh, good leverage type um, player. I think he's he's definitely on the roster. And then it was Jonathan Harris who was really kind of running with uh, a lot with the first team in the rotation back then. But man, after after the preseason game, I think the coaches kind of had a reset on that and started thinking about other players that may may move Harris out of that spot. He may still get that role, but I think that's one up in the air. And I, I think it actually is Henningsen. I mean, he was running with the first team and off, always with the second team on the defensive line in practice yesterday. He looks pretty good for a rookie. I mean, a late round draft choice, but he looks he looks pretty good. So I think he's kind of pushing Harris for that last spot. And I, I think that's one of the few other than that six wide receiver that's kind of up in the air. And uh, I, I think it might be Henningsen uh, coming out on top, which is a surprise. I thought they might try and sneak him on the practice squad, but I, I don't think so. I think, uh, I think they really like him, and I think he might take that spot. And uh, Harris might be uh, out, might be out off the team looking for another another job somewhere else. I don't know. I mean, they like Harris too. It was just a, a really bad performance, I thought, from him in that preseason game. So I think the coaches are really starting to rethink that. we got Christopher Reclosado asking about any additional news on the performance of Damari Mathis. When I saw him playing in camp, he looks good. Uh, for a rookie cornerback, he looked really good. And I, you know, from an analytics perspective, I thought that that, cornerback taken in the fourth round is going to be one of those that don't really play much and kind of, you know, they're out of the league pretty soon uh, based on the history of, of taking cornerbacks in those mid rounds, especially the fourth round, but he looks solid. Uh, I think he's going to be one of the, one of the key depth players that, uh, that come off of the bench for them uh, in a lot of those, uh, you know, uh, cornerback, uh, more cornerback sets like the, you know, that they're, they're going to end up playing when these this pass happy league. So um, he looks pretty good. I also think that the late round, seventh round, uh, Fayon Hicks looks pretty good too. So they're gonna, they're happy with those two corners. I don't know if Hicks is going to um, make the team. He might try and they might try and get him on the practice squad. But Mathis is definitely solidly in that rotation. Uh, and I didn't see anything from practice yesterday that would uh, um, change my mind on that. So yeah, I, uh, I, I like him and I think the coaches really like him too. So, um, and then now <laughs> the other thing, the other key piece that I think a lot of people are, are wondering about, and I am too, and that's the edge rushers. The Broncos have a stable of good, really good edge rushers. Uh, so, I mean, Gregory obviously hasn't, hasn't played that much, you know, recovering from that surgery, but you know, he's the starter Chubb's the other starter. I think that's a a solid, a solid duo behind him is obviously Baron Browning. Uh, Baron Browning has uh, taken a, a stranglehold on that third guy coming in off the bench. He is dynamic, athletic, and he can set the edge. So, 
Uh, I don't see why he's not going to get a bunch of playing time at the edge and uh, and obviously, you know, move back a little bit off ball once in a while because I saw that in practice too where he was coming back off the ball. And then, you know, Malik Reed was one that was intriguing to me. I thought maybe they would um, look to try and maybe tr get a trade for him because they have a stable of pass rushers. But his experience is uh, is pretty valuable um, if somebody goes down. So, you know, he's he's one that is intriguing to me. Do they keep him and move somebody else off the roster that they really like to try and sneak on the practice squad or something like that? I don't know, but, uh, you know, he and Reed yesterday was moving off ball as well. So that was an interesting, interesting turn of events. I mean, I know Browning can play off the ball uh, really well, but they had Malik Reed uh, playing off the ball. So we'll see what happens with that. Um, and then obviously Benito's going to be there. It's the fourth guy. And then after that, it's, it's, it is a dogfight really to get a fifth edge rusher spot. And I don't know if they could keep six with all the other, you know, injuries that have happened and the uncertainty in other areas. So, it, you know, Cooper was finally back into real practices. He'd been kind of nursing that finger that he hurt. I saw him uh, with the ones quite often in practice. So he's got, you know, he had a great season last year. So we'll see. I mean, Kongbo was, was coming in there often. I, man, it's, it's going to be a tough decision in that edge rusher group, I think. Um, and that's one that's still up in the air. So there's a couple groups that are still up in the air. I think wide receiver a little bit, um, definitely defensive line, that last position, and then edge rusher. There's going to be it's going to be tough, uh, tough decision for for the coaches. I think uh, on that edge rusher room, if they if they uh, you know have Cooper out, that guy's going to get picked up right away. So uh, I think uh, I think teams know he's a good edge depth player, and so it's going to be it's going to be tough. Michael Ronquillo, do you keep six or seven wide receivers on the 53-man roster? You only keep six. Uh, you, you, If you keep that seventh, uh, and thank you for that question. I appreciate it. If you keep that seventh wide receiver, you're taking it from somewhere else. Could be the edge group. It, you know, could be some other, you know, they, they have injury with Billy Turner's injury coming back on the offensive line. They may want to keep an extra person there. I just don't think they can keep seven wide receivers. And if you look at last season, the combination of the players that were the six wide receiver, I think only were targeted two times uh, last season. If I remember correctly, it wasn't more than five. So you keep a sixth and a seventh wide receiver, they're going to get the seventh wide receivers, not going to get any targets and not much playing time, except for maybe on special teams. But I mean, the only reason you keep, keep seven is if you loved a wide receiver at the bottom of the depth chart more than you like, um, you know, someone on the defensive line or somebody in the tight end room or, or somebody in the edge rusher group. So the ma roster math just doesn't work out for that seventh wide receiver. I don't, I don't believe. So I don't think they keep seven. I don't, I don't think they can. In fact, I think before Patrick's injury, they were going to keep five again. And, and, but Patrick's injury really kind of put a, a damper on that uh, particular uh, strategy. So um yeah, a seventh wide receiver is, is kind unless they're an amazing special teams player. It is kind of a waste of a roster spot. Jordan Roussel, I've not seen you on here before. Thank you for coming in. Who is your surprise cut for the 53-man roster? You know, that's a good question. I don't I don't see a surprise cut right now. I thought actually early on it might be uh Mike Purcell. But he's definitely uh, he's definitely solid in the rotation. Um, I don't I don't know who that surprise cut may be, um, but I think it might come from the edge group. Uh, I think that's going to be the surprise. Somebody's going to get cut from that edge group that you really wish they would hold on to. But the numbers game when you're trying to make this roster, it just doesn't add up. But I will say this. Benito and Browning were playing a ton on special teams. They are solidly in, on that roster for sure. And if there's another person from the edge group that gets mixed into the uh, special teams a lot on uh, on Saturday, that's probably going to be your uh, your edge guy. Uh, they're they're using them in special teams, which is why they're not keeping a lot of inside linebackers. The inside linebackers often are those coverage guys. But if you're using edge rushers like Benito and Browning who can do it, 
I mean, they're by dynamic players. You don't have to keep as many edge rushers. They're going to keep four. Or, I mean, so, sorry, inside linebackers. They're going to keep probably four. And they're going to use a practice squad for uh, for depth, And uh, it's which is a big change from the previous regime where I think one time they kept six inside linebackers, which or maybe even seven. I, one year they had a ton of inside linebackers, and that was for special teams. So, I, I mean, I think it's going to be out of the edge group. So thank you for that question. And thank you for, for joining. <clears throat> I haven't, I haven't seen you on here before, so I appreciate it. It's uh it's great. And the, uh, to continue with the edge group, Browning's all, it was always playing with the ones with, with Grant uh, Gregory out. So uh, it's going to be, that's going to be fun to watch. So pay attention to those groups that I'm talking about in preseason. So you can see who you, who may or may not make the roster. So the, the six wide receiver, whoever's playing on special teams the most is probably going to get that position. Edge, uh, <clears throat> we'll see. I mean, that one, I don't know if we can really tell, but if there's somebody playing special teams a lot from the edge group, that's going to be the, the um, player that probably makes the team. So uh, it's going to be fun to watch these edge, this edge rusher group. And again, don't read too much into last preseason game. <clears throat> I mean, I'm sure it's been talked about on podcasts and in written form a ton, but you're, if the Broncos have to go to their second and third team, for the most part, all over the, the, um, all over the group, the, the team's going to go nowhere this year. That means that they've been injured uh, heavily and, you know, the season's pretty much over on that respect. So um, <clears throat> Jeremy Sean coming in with uh, Jalen Virgil is making a push. Uh, at that wide receiver. Yes, he is. He definitely is. He's, uh, a, you know, his role as a returner, uh, he would probably get him on the team, but they have Montreal Washington. So Virgil's been playing really good on as a receiver. And if they were judging it on there, it'd even be, you know, it'd be a, a he'd really make a push for that team. But I, don't, I haven't seen him on special teams much. Um, and we'll see this preseason how much he plays on special teams. So keep an eye for that. Uh, but it was a fun practice. I enjoyed it. Even though I got sunburned, um, it, it was, it was eye opening. and it's great to, when you're there live to see what's going on because, you know, you don't get, you don't get that opportunity. You know, if you're not, if you're not there watching, even when they're going through really light, uh, practice with shirts and shorts, you can still glean a lot of information. So I had a great time and I just want to shout out to USAA for helping make that uh, possible. So thank you very much. Albert Knoppers coming in from Facebook again. Thank you, uh, for that. I appreciate it. So, um, I think I'll take one last, uh, comment here, uh, before I go into the mile high legend, which is, which is a fun one. I, uh, hopefully you enjoy it. It's got a little bit of a twist at the end. So stick around for that. Jace FTW. What is the true split between Melvin and Javante? That's an interesting question. I think Javante is going to carry most of the load, but if uh, when when I was talking with uh, Dr. Emmett Smith last week, Javante has always had a second running back to kind of help with the load. So I don't think it's going to be much different. I think Javante is going to have more carries than than Gordon does this year if they both stay healthy. Uh, but it's, he's Melvin's still going to carry a lot of the load, keep Javante fresh. And, um, so I, I would, if it's 70 to 25, I'd be surprised. I think it's going to be more, closer to 50, 50 again than that. Uh, but the thing is if you play fantasy football, which I, I don't very, I mean, I used to, but I don't anymore. Uh, just keep in mind, I think Gordon's got a nose for the end zone. He's going to take some of those, um, some of those, uh, red zone carries in for touchdowns, uh, that's going to hurt uh, Javante's stats a little bit. Uh, but yeah, I think he's going to get, John's going to get more carries and, but I also want to point out that in the West coast offense, you're going to see, you're probably going to see both of them in the backfield at the same time once in a while. And you're going to see Melvin Gordon catching a lot of passes out of the backfield. Both of them are, but I think, I think Melvin Gordon might be your third down back consistently. And I, I don't think you're going to see, uh, Mike Boone play a whole lot except for, you know, a few spots here and there. I, I think Gordon's your third down back. He, he, he's an all around game. Really. He can catch passes. He can, uh, he can block and he can run, obviously run the ball. So yeah, Javante is going to get the load, but you're going to see a lot of Mel, Melvin Gordon, especially on third down. 
Okay. Thank you for joining uh, the show today. It's been fun. It's been, uh, it, I, I love going to practice and seeing it, seeing what's happening and being able to, to relay that information to you guys. So again, if, tell your friends and family about the show, uh, have them jump on and watch, listen to some of the history. So, and, and that history is going to come in right now. I'm going to kind of wrap the show up now, as I usually do with the Mile High Legend. So, um, Next week, I'm uh, going to have another Mile High Legend. Uh, I don't know what it is, so I can't give you a hint yet, but uh, watch for it on Twitter. I'll announce what that is going to be. Uh, there's a few good stories that I'm trying to figure out which one would be would be great for, for next week. But this week's Mile High Legend is, is, is fun and interesting. So the Denver Broncos have had a multitude of receivers, uh, prolific receivers in their storied history of the franchise. That lineup really started in 1960 with Lionel Taylor. I mean, he was a legend. He was the first to catch 100 pass passes in the history of the NFL. And then through the years, fans have been witness to other greatness, like Haven Moses, who's probably one of the best pure deep threats in the history of the league. Rod Smith, uh, the greatest undrafted wide receiver of all time. Ed McCaffrey, who may be the toughest to ever play <laughs> the position. And then, of course, you got the late uh, Demarius Thomas, who combined with Peyton Manning to make uh, the greatest offense in history. And there are many more that really could be named. There's, it's a laundry list of greats who caught passes from legendary quarterbacks. But there might be one player who is the most dynamic of them all, and a player nobody would expect to be named with these legends at receiver of anyone in Broncos history to catch at least 75 passes in their career. This player leads them all in yards per reception. His 20 and a half yards is two and a half more than Haven Moses, who is one of the greatest in history of the NFL in this high watermark. So that's an impressive statistic for this person. And added to that incredible statistic is 11 touchdowns, which actually equals a touchdown for every seven of his receptions. He was a dynamic player catching passes. His career started in the Mile High City in 1968, and he retired from the franchise in 1976, a career that spanned nine years. And with that long career in Denver, people should remember his receiving ability. And Jim Sakamano described him as one of the finest athletes to play his position. And even with these gaudy, gaudy numbers and accolades, he only played receiver sparingly. In his career, for his career, he only caught 82 passes for 1,684 yards. And his most impressive stats didn't come from catching passes. They came from punting. In 1970, he led the league in punts and yardage. And in 73, he had the longest punt in the league at 78 yards. He was also the top 10 in gross punting average five times during his career. And he led, he led all Broncos with 23,986 career punting yards until Tom Ruin came along and passed him two decades later. And he still ranks number two overall in punting. One of the best directional kickers in the Mile High City. His legendary status came from his leg, not his hands. His name, Billy Van Heusen, a Broncos punting legend and quite possibly the most dynamic receiver to ever don the orange and blue. And that is your Mile High Legend. Thank you for joining and have a great day, Broncos fans.